Hey, hey, people, Seth here. Apologies for the delays. I've been busy bone mashing for the past few weeks. Uh, look it up. I really don't think I need to explain myself or why gently hammering my chin and cheeks will eventually mold my natural skull to that of a Cro-Magnon grug. Uh, listen, I've been listening to Alpha Podcasts, and according to men talking to other men, women desire nothing more than a man that looks like Australopithecus. But between my transformation of mind and body, I've been playing something real good. Songs of Conquest is a turn-based HOM-like, a genre which currently has four games in it, and that's including Heroes 6 and 7. Songs of Conquest is a spiritual successor to Heroes of Might and Magic, and it's a damn good one, which means I am spiritually contracted by the laws of a greater universe, by the creator sons who built this plane of Eurasia to see this game financially prosper. Remember, in this life I am nothing but the mouthpiece of Moloch. I'm just here to tell you what to consume. I like my games like I like my women. A famous YouTuber once told me, while driving past the local kindergarten, Garden. Early access. This is not a joke, it's a cry for help. Ever since the gold play button arrived, I've realized I'm in a den of predators, and there's a hierarchy. Every blood moon we have to offer the vitae of a child to Mr. Beast. If you refuse to comply, UMG will copy strike all your videos. And I really need that AdSense money. Songs of Conquest is early access. Technically, it's completely functional and has more than enough content to justify the price tag, which is ironic because I didn't pay for it. Gameplay. Because I've played so much Heroes, I do primarily talk about this game in comparison to Heroes of Might and Magic. So, what's in common? It's a turn-based fantasy strategy where each player owns a number of heroes with a limited number of moves per turn. They can be used to fight monsters, take resources, and upgrade towns to fill their ranks with more powerful units. The objective is to defeat every other player. Player. Differences. There's no overland spells, thank God, because I'm tired of living in a world with town portals and dimension doors, where a single man can simultaneously defend every town on the map, yet lives in perpetual fear of a dungeon player, who, depending on RNG, has both a movement points and mana to dimension door across the entire map, and take every single town you own in a single turn. I find this entertaining, engaging, dopaminergic, and to the person who inflicted this upon me after a four-hour game, I wish you a very pleasant retrograde ejaculation. Instead of heroes, they're called welders. Welders are attuned to essence, the magic of this world. Every unit generates a unique type and quantity of essence when their turn begins, adding to the welder's total. You have one spell book containing every spell. That might sound underwhelming, until you realize I never said anything about casting one spell, because you can cast every spell multiple times and they stack. How many spells can you cast in a single turn? Infinite. Your only limitation is imagination. And of course, the amount of essence you possess. Combat is effectively a chessboard, except my queen gets 10 consecutive moves because I collected 21 yellows and purples. Towns are no longer a single screen. They're actual towns surrounded by external buildings. These are modular. You can build whatever you want, provided you've got the space for it. Unlike heroes where units are produced in bulk at the start of each week here, you produce a constant supply every day. This uh, takes a bit of getting used to, but the logic is uh, you get to see an immediate return on your investment. Immediately. As opposed to seven days. And because build sites are modular, there's nothing stopping us from building six rat warrens at the same time, and dedicating ourselves to playing a purely rat-based experience. Generally, you produce more than you have actual money to buy. Economy is important, and we must increase our GDP. For this reason, half the towns I conquer, out of necessity, will become plantations. Yes, it's a fantasy military campaign. And you know what? It still runs on corn. Also, I have found that all the resources I ever need cannot be found. So I have to build markets, and then I have to build more markets to offset the horrible exchange rate, because I cannot afford to buy lean rock at such prices. Conquering the town of another faction gives you several options. Raise it to the ground and rebuild as your own, convert the town, which replaces each building with your respective faction equivalent, or occupy the town, which means you keep it intact, you can't do anything with it, but for every turn it's occupied, you generate an obscene amount of money. In case you haven't figured it out, you can't mix races. Sorry, that 
that doesn't sound very good. You can't mix different factions in this game. Some might be upset about this, but there's a very simple explanation. Each of the four races generate very different types of essence. If you could mix and match, you would have access to the strongest spell combinations in the game, which, by design, are intentionally difficult to obtain. Combat is very similar to heroes. If you're not familiar, each unit is called a stack. The number represents how many identical units are inside that stack. For example, these are ducks. They are a stack of seven ducks, but I can split them into seven stacks of one duck. Does that make sense? Either way, I can't hear you, so I'm going to continue. Depending on the command ability of your welder, your army contains between three to nine stacks. Unlike heroes, your stack has a maximum size depending on the unit. This is so you actually play the game, instead of playing Necropolis, which involves waiting inside your base until the numbers get so high, they stop rendering. I'll never forget the tactical genius of telling all my units to wait, only for my Brazilian opponent to match my strategic prowess by making all of his units wait, which put us right back to the beginning as if nothing ever happened. Delaying your turn to bait out the enemy, thankfully, is no longer an option. Every unit now has a zone of control, meaning if you enter any of these surrounding hexagons, you can't leave or pass without provoking an attack of opportunity. Consequently, reaching your opponent's backline is guaranteed death for his ranged units. Conversely, ranged units benefit from high elevation. The higher you are, the bigger your range and the harder it is for melee units to reach you. Compared to heroes, unit upgrades are very pricey. However, the upgraded form of every unit is a, about a two-fold power difference, which doesn't account for all the abilities they receive. These range from game-changing to I'm going to play the bagpipes. Currently, there's four races to play. Arleon, Rana, Baria, and the Barony of Loth. Arleon is post-collapse Rome, a formerly dominant empire carved up by barons and feudal lords, trying desperately to hold on to the status quo. That is, if Rome allied itself with the entire furry community. Honestly, I kind of get it. Imagine uh, you were an explorer and you stumble upon this isolated village inside the Amazon, consisting entirely of Crystal the Fox, but there's no males, so uh, you gotta do your part. You gotta turn those woodland creatures into woodland Twinkies, because if you don't, they won't survive. Barya is uh, literally the Merchants Guild. They're a federation of technologically advanced merchant states who uh, also engage in a little slavery, which is uh, unfortunately where the comparison ends, because uh, we've never owned slaves. I actually asked my relatives and technically, what we had would be referred to as serfs. Rana represent the scalies, the frogs, and everything else that comes out of a swamp. Typically, if you have more than four limbs, you get to be part of Rana. Enslaved and abused for generations, their natural response, understandably, is to murder everyone. Finally, we've got the Barony of Loth, a breakaway faction of Arleon. The only difference? Necromancy. They're trying to bring back the good old days by raising them from the dead. For reference, one of their basic units is a loyal soldier brought back from the dead. Their strongest is several soldiers buried close together, so when resurrected, they fuse together into a giant lump. And that's about it for gameplay. There's people to kill, treasure to loot, and cities to plunder. Pretty much the quintessential hero's experience. This game can be played both on and offline, single player and multi. It's not very clear, but you can actually hot seat this game, as in, uh, play with two people on the same computer. All you have to do is tag yourself in for two slots when starting the map. There's currently no mechanic to hide the screen between turns, so I recommend putting a blanket over it before you press and turn. Still, there's no guarantee people won't try to peek, which is why I record the entire session on a USB camera. My house is a very fun place. Hey Seth, why is there a proximity sensor? Good question. Why is there movement at 3 in the morning? There's also a map editor, and it's very good. You can do a lot of complex events without having to understand the code behind it. Conversely, for the Heroes 5 video, I had to learn a scripting language just to make a 10 second joke. Finally, there's the single player campaign, which leads us to the story. Story. There's currently two campaigns, Arleon and Rana, each consisting of four different missions. Do not be fooled. These are deceptively long and take a while to finish. The Arleon campaign is a good introduction to the game. It shows you the ropes and helps you understand the core concepts. However, your main character, Cecilia, is a unit focused welder. So you won't get a super deep appreciation of the essence system until you've had more time 
time to play around with it. She's not a spellcaster, so you won't get access to better spells unless you know exactly how to level up and tilt the skill priority. And for the record, I don't think most people playing right now even realize you can do that. So unless you know exactly what you're doing, which spoiler, you don't, you're going to have a mixed experience. That's because you'll mostly have order essence, which is very buff heavy, but it's not spectacular and you don't have it leveled up. So you won't even get to see its full potential. It's a mild complaint and you can fix it by playing Verona campaign. At the end of each mission, you are rewarded with uh, singing. I'll be honest, uh, I skipped this in the beginning because I felt secondhand embarrassment, uh, but eventually I grew to like it and just embraced the experience. I thought about it. The bards of yesterday are pretty much the SoundCloud rappers of today. So why did I produce such an automatic, visceral response? Maybe the Zoomer population could relate a little more. Maybe if uh, every mission was concluded uh, with a short performance by the uh, prodigious Lil Yachty. Maybe the eventual Barony of Loth campaign could feature lyrics by XXX Tentacion, which would be fitting because, you know, they're undead. And he is, um similar. Right now, the game is always changing. There's patch notes almost every week, nerfing some kind of exploit, which was usually the core of my strategy. So I'm forced to make this review even faster to try and outpace the balance team. I'm obviously using a plural, but I know who you are. Carl. Listen, I'm just a young blood trying to make it in the projects. I'm raised on a staple diet of oatmeal and uh, ironic webms of anime girls about to undress, where in the last second, they pull a bait and switch on you, swapping to animated footage of African-American men reflecting shower water using their developed glutes. But you gotta keep a brother down when you capped essence generation to six a unit. Why you gotta do this to me? He's doing this quicker than I can write the script. And no, I am not going to correct myself. I'm just gonna Photoshop over it and pretend it still works. Section three, abusing the game. The following is an unsorted list of things I've discovered. Spells, spells are interesting. Spells can be stacked for great effect. For example, knights have the ability to charge. For every tile they cross, they deal more damage. But if you cast quicken and stack it repeatedly, they can run back and forth across the entire battlefield several times over until finally they collide with the enemy. Pacify a monster. Do it twice. Whatever damage it used to do, it doesn't and now can be safely beaten to death using string instruments. Charge Essence allows a necromancer to generate his essence twice per turn. Strengthen Essence allows any unit generating essence to generate even more. Casting Strengthen Essence twice on free necromancers gives you 36 balls worth of arcane and destruction. That's two arcane storms and two fireballs every turn, or you can repel him five times. The displacement may be physical, but the damage is psychological. I found out repel also works on your units. This enables us to perform drive-bys. You know what else works on your units? Blood boil. Wait, what's this? A rat go berserk when injured, doing double damage? Very curious. Blind hatred makes a unit randomly attack another. At max level, this happens three times in sequence. So we force a militia to attack a horned one. The horned one berserks one shots the militia and everyone around it. You can cast this on your own units as well. Charge a high legion into enemy ranks. By the way, legion attacks cleave through enemies into adjacent targets. Cast blind hatred. Watch as they peel everyone around them like a potato. And then continue your turn because that didn't count as an attack. If that ever sounds unfair, just remember you can take three stacks of dragons, take three turns, and then cast rejuvenate to get six turns, and then cast mist on them, turning them invisible until the next turn. This doesn't affect you because they're faster than everyone else, which puts you in an infinite loop where you can attack the enemy and turn invincible before he can ever respond every single turn. But when you have so many dragons, you're building tall. So I cast justice, which kills nine of a stack, regardless of what they are. Each time I cast that spell, you lose 30k, which makes you rather upset. So you patch it the next day. Whatever am I going to do? Oh, um, that's right. I'll just cast it again. Alternatively, take advantage of the essence system to build wide and fill every army slot with a one stack. Good idea, but you're not the first. There's a mechanic called momentum. Essentially, each time you kill a stack, everyone on your team does more damage, but they also take less damage. For this reason, losing several units in a row quickly spirals out of control and may cost you the entire fight. Ignore my advice, continue to one stack. Have your opponent cast apocalypse on your ass. Realize in that moment, his welder has essence leech. Why? 
watch as your essence gets stolen, multiplied by free, and used against you. Going wide isn't bad, as per se, but there's more interesting ways to do it. Sacrifice nine stacks of blessed bones to make nine stacks of skeletons to generate 18 units worth of essence. Then, do it again to make 27. Paint the map. Don't stop until there's no more free space. When walking is no longer an option. When the concept of moving forward implies we can burn it quicker than it grows. Earth block is a great spell. So great, in fact, that nobody could invade towns anymore. Melee units would desperately tunnel through the jungle, dying from 10 billion trillion arrows before they even got close. According to the patch notes, they fixed it. What does that mean? Absolutely nothing, because I'm still doing it. In this game, the laws of physics are less of an obligation and more of a rough guideline, which I've chosen to ignore. I don't need to explain how a cannon, which normally has to reload between shots, can fire the same cannonball 10 times in a row. But if you stack multi-attack on a hell breath, anything is possible. Spells have a lot of fine print. For example, rapid fire gives every ranged unit an extra attack, but it's not based on the unit's turn, it's based on the entire round. So three different units shoot six times, but because it's still the same round, we cast rejuvenate and shoot 12 times. I love this game. Swap is a very versatile spell. What's that? A tightly knit circle of spellcasters? Allow me to swap in my hyena with his mage, leaving his forces with no option but to kill themselves, because a hyena retaliates first and has infinite retaliations. Defending against the siege, decide that I want my ballistas even closer. His strongest unit is now at the top of my tower, so I fence him off into a little playpen. Bad smell gas, a leading cause of brap-related mortality. Swapping two units inside a cloud of gamer girl miasma makes them gag all over again, forever, until their nostrils bleed and their organs collapse out of mercy to escape this mustard hell. I know my imagery is evocative, but for the record, I'm not into this. I have a flowery imagination, and uh, I'm an empath, which means even if I'm not a brat fag, I have walked that path, and I have found it to be morally dubious. It's time to change the topic. The most ridiculous swap I've ever done is with an artificer. Place a landmine directly in front of him, target an enemy on the same lane, and swap him out. The landmine is now directly behind the enemy. Cast Repel, and watch them forcibly eat the landmine twice, because for some reason, repelling people into traps applies the damage twice. At this point, I am so far gone, I don't even know where exploits begin and mechanics end. Case in point, normally, it takes a while to get your economy rolling and producing troops, but when you recruit a welder, they spawn with some units already. Now, if you dismiss them, they disappear from the game, but they can be rehired with the same starting units. So, right from the start, we print a bunch of high-end units, steamroll through the early turns, and pay off our investment. This is, objectively, the best way to play, as according to my subjective feelings. Then, I wondered to myself, could I abuse the hire and dismiss mechanic even more? Of course I did. Why else would I write this? There's a very interesting skill in this game called Tutor. When two friendly welders interact, max level Tutor grants 75% of a Tutor's total experience to the other welder, at uh, no cost. When welders level up, they get offered skills. Depending on your choices, you get offered a different power at levels 8 and 16. Paired with a high level Tutor, I abuse this to train 8 different welders in the blink of an eye. We avoid skills with combat and magic. We take only miscellaneous passive income. So, when we hit level 8, we get access to levy, which means at level 16, we get the upgrade. Rank 2 levy is a power that grants you a global 60% increase in unit production. Multiplied by 8 welders and rounded up, that's 500% more dragon every turn. That's 6 dragons a day. It's actually insane. Alternatively, your opponent is running a counter to your build, so you build the counter to his counter. Except in your case, it takes you 5 Five seconds to counter his entire game, or you realize you can't win. A fair fight, that is. But who said we had to fight fair? We're going to win by losing, and they're going to lose by winning. We train up a bunch of welders to get the first turn. We nuke the field, we kill units many times our value, and then we die. And then we do it again, and again, until eventually they have no troops left with which to fight. At which point, I start to mock them. I call them gay, and uh, immediately apologize. Unless they identify with that label. In which case, I send a little kiss, you know, to establish dominance. I've told you a lot of abuse, but ultimately the strongest tactic in this game is uh, just play Rana. All the Rana initiative upgrades prepared level 3 and eager level 2 results in the highest possible initiative in the entire game. There is no counterplay, because you don't get to play, you just get to watch. As Sun Tzu famously said, when two men sword fight in the shower, the winner strikes first. At the end of the day, balance 
I don't give a shit because I want something interesting to me. I played a lot of Heroes multiplayer and guess what? It sucked. There's very little dopamine to be had from playing online. Here, it's a lot better. Games go faster, you fight quicker, and more often. You have to carve a path up to your enemy and manage supply lines. You don't just win out of the blue without some foreshadowing or momentum. Based on the title, you would expect some good music, and you'd be correct. I think the music is generally fantastic, but the Arleon and Frog tracks have a particular nest in my heart. The amount of sprite work done for this game is absolutely insane. When I realized they made a unique sprite for every welder, that there's nine per faction, so they had to make 36 of them. I felt pretty humble. All the sprites and all the animations are beautiful. It's generally just a beautiful game. In summary, the world is incredibly starved for games like Songs of Conquest, and I'm gonna shill it as hard as I can, or for as long as my attention span holds. <laughs> I'm such a Gemini. Why? Because it represents a return to the 2000s, where products had long-term appeal and complexity, where some respect was given to the temporary very finite human experience which yearns for cognition and introspection. If you don't believe me, imagine releasing the ancient game of Mahjong as a standalone product today. It would play for you automatically until you reach a perfect 50-50 win-loss ratio, regardless of your own skill. It would have gacha mechanics. They would be described as forgiving, reasonable, and I'm paid to write this article, where 10,000 pulls grants you a single pity pull, where you can take out a loan at the press of a button to buy more gacha. And that little twig you throw is a DLC sold separately. In conclusion, I forgot the point I was trying to make. Get your car and go buy a 40 pound bag of rice. Trust me, you'll thank me later. Songs of Conquest. I adore this game and highly recommend it. If you're interested, follow my link for 30% off on GOG for the next 10 days. I think. I'm not sure. Yo, editor, clip this out. That's a joke. I don't have an editor. This is probably the best discount and lowest price ever offered, so please take advantage of it. I'd like to say this is made possible because of my inflated ego, a mechanism of overcompensation for my non-existent self-worth. But in reality, and though it pains me to say this, the man who made this possible is French. As always, more content to come, so stay tuned. I need to sell out. A warm thanks to the many members of the Merchants Guild generously funding and bankrolling these videos. You're all truly wonderful. Have a good one.